Ian Roberts, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. It's my pleasure, mate. It's nice. It's actually nice to be invited. It's nice to be remembered. It's always good for <laughs> it's always good for the ego, mate. Oh, absolutely, mate. Um, yeah, you were an absolute legend of, of the game. Um, one of those hard nosed players. Um, some might call you a bit of a psycho on the field. Um, which uh, watching some of your highlights, mate, you were an absolute crazy man. But you know, you've you've always been one of those guys. Um, because my dad's a manly fan. Um, he absolutely adored the way you played the game. Um, that's uh, you know, that's better, mate. I um. Yeah, I, I will say uh, definitely at um, uh, the early stages of my career, um, I would probably suggest looking back, you know, I did have a bit of a chip on my shoulder for, for other reasons as well, but um, and that kind of, you know, that kind of added or accumulated in having a bit more of an aggressive, I don't know, I know if that's the right word, aggressive approach, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, like I, I'm also kind of fortunate, James, I, you know, I was, um, I was kind of lucky enough to be playing at a time when that style of play suited that era, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, now my dad was a, a huge, he's a huge man, manly fan. He was a huge fan of yours. Sorry, and mate. Quite... The, cat's just, the cat's just joined the interview. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, I remember we, uh, me and my dad were at the Brisbane airport one day and, um, you, know, you you were playing for the Cowboys at the time and you guys walked past and he just went, holy, he looked up and went and just went, holy crap. Like, obviously, use different language. Um, yeah, he's a monster of a man. Oh, um, um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. I suppose, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 that's kind of, it's kind of flattering, I suppose. I was, I mean, I will, particularly, I've always been bigger than your average bear, you might say, mate. Um, uh, but, you know, early in my career, like uh, my junior football, I played lock and, you know, right right from when I first started playing, I was halfback. I played halfback. I mean, I used to be quite small until I went through the change of life and then I kind of shut up. And I was always kind of lean and lanky and, um, uh, yeah, kind of had that giraffe gallop about me, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I just – I remember that. It's always stood out for me from when I was a little kid, um, you know, that – that comment that dad made about you, because like I said, he, he he adored the way you played the game. And um, obviously he's a bit disappointed when you left Manly, but, um, you know, that, that is the way it is. I mean, I think, um, yeah, it is always, uh, it always, it is quite a, quite a moment in every player's life when they change clubs. When I first, um, when I left South to go to Manly originally, that was quite a, um, I mean, I look back now, and it was really a, a nothing situation, but it seemed so monumental at the time. Uh, and particularly when, when, when you're a professional player or a sports person, those moments, um, you, you kind of look back and they, they, they seem so intense. Well, at the time, I do remember them being so intense and so, like, um, polarising in, in, in the fact that, well, you know, were you doing the right thing? Was it for the right reasons? And this, that. But, I mean, looking back, I mean, it's... It's just a career in sport, really. I mean, that's you know, that's kind of the peaks and valleys that we all have. Um, I can say that every time I moved clubs, um, it was personally a better situation for me. I mean, I don't think. I mean, definitely when I moved from South to Manly, I, I think my, my my form improved, even though I was playing like quite good football at Manly in my younger years. Uh, sorry, at South when I first started. Um, yeah. Um, I do think that because I moved to Manly, I was about 24, I think, and I was kind of – my body was a lot more mature and my, also my concept of, of, of what style of play needed was needed for, for that, like I, I said earlier, about that um, the style of football being played around that time. Um, yeah, I think my, my, my play improved. I also took much more of a um, – I suppose like a leadership role. I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, I don't know if I ever felt like that, but I, looking back, it's kind of, I guess, what it what it was. Um, and then when I went, I left um, Manly. That was around that whole Super League drama. If you remember, I uh, I'd signed with uh, Super League um, at the end of '94. Uh, no, sorry, the start of '95 when we came back from the Kangaroo Tour. And uh, but I was due to play for Manly through to the nine end of the. 96 season but um there was a whole load of controversy that and i was fully um going to obligate my manly contract right through to the end of 96 but in 95 and i 
I can say that um, the AR, it was in the ARL. They announced that no Super League players would be permitted to play State of Origin or, or play for Australia. And I, I ended up sitting the year out in 96. <laughs> Manly went, actually won the competition that year, so they, they didn't miss me. But um, myself and Gordon Tallis, I think, were, the, were two players that sat out because we were in breach of contract. Um, we, we thought we were. And that was proven in the courts as well. But it also, mate, when I, when I then went to, um, to the Cowboys, even though it wasn't the best football, you know, I, I was there 97, 98, and started 99. Um, and by that stage, I, you know, I was, um, I was publicly, I was, I was, I was a gay, I was a, I, I'd come out in 94, 95 as a gay man. Um, but I, I was made club captain at, at, at the Cowboys in, in, um, in 97, which was kind of like revolutionary at that time to have a gay man as a, as a, and that was now like, uh, you know, as club captain, but you know, the football probably wasn't as good as my form definitely wasn't as good. Cause I was getting on in years. I'd had a few injuries, but I will say I did have a lifestyle change, a lifestyle way. And I, I had an incredibly fantastic time in, in Townsville and the football. I, I really, even though we weren't, the winning team that we were when I was at Manly and South, um, I enjoyed my probably enjoyed my football more at, at the Cowboys because it was very, very much a community. Um, and that was when, like, the whole because of Super League had brought in that whole professional um, uh, atmosphere. Like, um, there was a real sense of professionalism through the whole club at all levels, um, right from you know, like, uh, people working in the office right through all the well-being divisions, um, all, all the player categories. Um, it, yeah, it was the first time that that had kind of crept into the game. So it was really nice being a part of that and, and having – being able to see the progression of, of league to where it is now. Like, I mean, you know, when I first started at South – geez, I'm talking a lot, aren't I? Sorry. No, you're um, right, mate. You're good. That's great. This is – this is um, exactly the stuff I would have asked you about anyway. I was just, I was just saying, um, when I first started at South, it was a very different era. Like I first started, my first um, year at, in first grade was 86. Mate, we used to train at five o'clock then, like, so everyone could get home from work and then go to training. Like it was a very different world. My first year at South, I made, I cleared nine and a half thousand dollars, right, for the whole year. And I thought I was flash, mate. I thought I was like, like smoking it was great you know like I, um, I was an electrician at the time but that was quite you know like I but I, th I thought I was doing really well I mean I I was kind of fortunate enough right at the end of my career with Super League uh, to be a part of some of the um, the bigger pay dose. but it was a very different world so it was kind of nice to have had been a part of that and also when I first came into grade it was very much more of like the style of game was much more physical much more violent there's a lot more off the ball like um uh, like vicious play and, and stuff. But that was all, that was just at the start when they were trying to phase all that out. So I kind of caught the tail end of that. Yeah. I mean, my first game, I guess, is a true story. First game, I would have been 20. Uh, and I was playing, uh, it was the charity shield. We played, um, South were playing uh, St. George. Uh, it was a regular thing they do. I think they just played that on, on last weekend. Yeah. Uh, but, um, so that was my first game. And, and like, I was opposite Craig Young. Craig Young was a bit of an idol for me. He was like, because I was playing front row, he was kind of like um, uh, the top shelf front row. But I did, I'll never forget um, Craig Coleman, who was our halfback at South, his nickname was Tugger. This is how crazy that, the, I mean, my, the forward pack I was in was pretty ferocious, right? We had Dave Boyle, Mario Fennick, Les Davison, Wayne Chisholm, Michael Andrews. All they were all kind of like they could really look after themselves, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, and I was the youngest by a couple of years. I was only twenty, but we we used to have this play, and this was a play, like like a set move, right? Like it's it's crazy to even be having this conversation with you, but it was called um, the move was called Henry, and what it was, um was Craig Coleman would walk through, just before we packed in the scrum, he would walk through the scrum and, Henry, Henry's on, Henry's on. You know what Henry was? Henry was, we had to start the all-in. It was a big, it was a puncher. That was actually a move that we had. I'll never forget, it was a second, honestly, it was like the second scrum of, 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 of my like of my first grade career, he played against Craig Young, and Tug had Craig Coleman walk through the middle. He said, oh, Henry's on, Henry's on. And I was like, Oh no! Like there's opposite me was Craig Young, right? And I was like, no, no way! 
anyway, so what happened? We packed down there, Mario and, and Les Davis and like started on it. And, it's a and I like, I, I kind of like Craig, Craig Young and he almost like, just like, like, is that your best kid? And he kind of grabbed me, he kind of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck. And he almost like put his fist through the back of my head. I just like, but I never figured that fear when I hit him. And he just didn't move. He just like he just stood there like, oh, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, it was a very uh... different, very different, very different game, mate. But I'm I'm kind of glad that I that I caught that tail end. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that that is a hell of a story, mate. Because yeah. that's for someone first game to come in and, and cop that, oh, my God, that would have been daunting. It was well. terrifying, right? Like, we, we did actually beat him that day, but I it was always like that first game. Was all, no, I do remember that that sense of fear and just like I felt like I was so out of my depth, like I thought I, as, as a young guy, and, and I, I suppose that's kind of a familiar story for any players coming into first grade. You do feel like you're out of, you know, out of your depth and um, – but yeah, I was kind of lucky. I did play with a pretty ferocious pack. It kind of looked after you. <laughs> I looked after us. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you also would have had um, Mark Carroll coming through very similar times to you. So as that, well. that, that, that was um, Spud didn't join South. I think Spud joined South in like, oh, wasn't it about 90, 1990 or something like that? I, I'd left South by the time Spud, oh, okay. Spud joined. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So, yeah, that's quite ironic, though, that yourself, you know, um, yeah, as I mentioned before, you know, you sort of, I guess, remembered as one of those, um, you know, nut, nut jobs of the game. And then Mark Carroll comes through from South as well. And he's also remembered as one of those nut jobs of the game. And he's both end up at Manly as well. Like, that's how well, ironic I, is I, that? I have a really good friendship with Spud. I speak to Spud, uh, Mark, quite quite regularly. He, uh, yeah, we, we, we have a, like a really nice friendship. We're still quite close now, mate. We still do, we still do um, some work around CTE and, um like uh, head knocks and you know the uh, the consequences of, of head trauma and that um, we do some public speaking and that together. We're also part of a couple of groups that that help mentor. Yeah, he's he's really good in and around that space, mate. He's a bit of a leader. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah I've, I've had the opportunity to interview him. So and he was he was great, fantastic. Come up a lot of stories. Um, but yeah, he's he was one of those guys as well. Um, you know, because my dad came, uh, grew up in that. 80s, 70s, 80s sort of era. Yeah, he loved that hardball sort of stuff. And Spud and I played together at Manly. I think Spud came to Manly in about oh, it would have been about 99 or 94 or 90, 93 or 94 because uh, he did he, he played in the 95 grand final that we lost. And then, um, so yeah, I think he came to Manly in 94. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, don't worry, the 95 grand final, my dad was spewing, oh. he was spewing about that. Do we have to talk about it? <laughs> no, don't worry about that one. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I've never been able to watch that game. I mean, I've um, yeah, and I should, should imagine um, this is you probably heard this story by from a lot of ex footballers. I just every time I sat down to watch that game, I mean, I, I can't I can't get through the, more than about ten minutes. And I, I know that might sound quite weak to someone who doesn't understand sport and the intensity of it, but I, I it's still it's still really awkward and uncomfortable. It, you know, I just. It, oh, it just feels like, um, you know, I've never been able to, to, to watch the game. I, I think that year, the worst thing that happened to us at Manly, because we played Cannery about oh, about five or six weeks out from the end of the uh, regular season, and yeah. we flogged them. We beat them. Oh, like, I can't remember what it was, but we flogged them by about 40, you know, about 40, 45 points. Yeah. That was the worst thing that could have happened to us. Like, yeah. Um, because we went into that, I do remember going to that grand, grand final feeling really confident, and our form had been really good. And I just, that I, I, uh, I'm confident enough to say that I wasn't the only one that was feeling that, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, yeah. you, live learn, you live and learn. They say you got to lose one to win one. They won next year. They, they won the year after. Yeah, well, that's what I was just about to mention is um, how did you feel, obviously, having to sit out that 96 season and, um, you know, watching your mates go go on to win that grand final? Yeah, I mean, like, I was I was, ha I was happy for them. Obviously, it's, it was like, you know, everyone wants to win a grand final. And I, I can't say that... Um, you know, the, 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 in some aspects, it, it wasn't upsetting to watch that. But uh, fundamentally, man, and I, like in principle, I, I do believe I did the right thing. Like the NRL had no had no grounds to stand us down for being representative players, even though we were aligned to Super League. I was fully obligated to honour my my NRL uh, my ARL contract, and I, and I don't think that we should have missed selection 
playing um, you know city country New South Wales or for Australia because we've been aligned to a, another competition in in like uh, twenty in in two years time and, mm-hmm. and you know and the courts kind of pr- like um, there's no I mean even though we were proven uh, not right but we, we you know the the uh, judgment went our way. Uh, it is it is still pretty disappointing having missed out on the grand final, like it is. But mm-hmm. you know, there's, and I've since learned, mate. Like, it, um, and I suppose everyone can say this: there's bigger things in life, mate. Like, you know what I mean? It, um, as a sports person, you know, you, you do want to achieve at the highest level and, and and play in those those competitions and games that that make a difference. But um, yep. you know, but um, yeah, there's worse things. There's there's much worse things in life, mate. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, for the people that don't understand it, it's it's a bit of, um, you know, you're, you're involved in that atmosphere and around the club, around the boys, week in, week out, day in, day out. You know, put all your effort and all your time into winning that grand final. And, you know, un- unfortunately, you know, you lose one and then you sort of, you're not a part of the next one. And they're yeah, all, I mean, you know, and it's, you're kind of touching on the psychology of sport, man. And it's, it's almost like, you know, you're almost like, Kind of touched on there when players retire, how, how difficult it is, because you know you're so used to the camaraderie and the structure of, of training. You know, like you're training five days a week. You see the guys on the weekend, at, either Saturday or Sunday, and play. And you do that for like you know not anywhere from ten to ten to twelve, thirteen years. It's pretty hard when you retire and all that's taken away. Like the first twelve months is is not too bad, but after that you kind of realise, you know, the structure that that you're used to living by and being a part of and everything's set out for you and you, you have a you know formula like a daily formula that you follow you know that's why some of these that's why some of these players struggle when they retire mate because it, it's been such a um a regime you know for the last upwards of 10 years um you know that's why so many players struggle with uh you know what next and like you know like you're looking at professions, you know, where, where players retire when they're 32, three, you know, if we say 35, there's, there's not many professions in the world where inverted commas, you know, you peak it when you're 35, you know I mean? Like, and that's it. Like you've already peaked in, in your career, if that makes sense. I mean, I've, yeah. what I mean by that is I've gone on to find, as most players do, you go on to find other stuff, but you don't realize that when you, when you retire, it feels yeah. like a year out. God, I've already peaked. What, what now? Like is, is that it? But like, yeah. That's what, yeah, that's what, you know, there's, um, yeah, you're talking about psychology stuff, mate, which is kind of, can be dark as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was looking through your stats in your career, mate. You know, oh, excuse me. Um, you, you represent South Sydney. And then is it the 86, 87 se- uh, season? You sort of, you go over to Wigan and play um, a few games over there for them. Um, how, how did that all work about? I was super, mate. Wigan, like we, I really found my feet in Wigan. I really found my um, uh, my skill set. Like my, I don't know if, it's, if that's the right term, but I kind of, I, I do feel like I found. I'm going to use the term now because people might be able to understand. I kind of found my my skill set. What, what I mean by that is because I'm, I'm British born. Um, yeah. So that was back in the day when uh, the off the English uh, played in the off season. So we could go you know, from our season to their season. Now they play the same time as us, so players can't do it anymore. But um, yeah, we we finished the season here, um, and what had happened was uh, because South had we had such a young side in '86. It was about seven. There were seven players who were under twenty three, and that was when there was it used to be under twenty threes, reserve grade, and first grade. Yeah. Um, and South under twenty threes had been going really well. And what it was back then, if you played. I think it was three of the last seven games in under 23s. You qualified for under 23s. So what we did at South, and you know, we, we even that first grade, we made the sem- we did make the semis. But what they had done in the, in the lead up to the semis over those last seven, t- uh, six or seven games, they rotated the seven players who were under 23, so they were eligible to play under 23s if if they kicked on. And as it turned out, I think um, I think first grade we made it through to the major final, which was the second week. And then we got kicked. I can't really remember. It was the second week we made it through, but the under twenty threes, um, because they that they, they um, we heart were like six or seven of us had had been eligible to play. We ended up playing in the under twenty threes grand final. We played Penrith, and we, we won pretty convincingly. But I flew out to England the next day, and then what I was saying originally was back then, um, 
every every English club was allowed three imports, but I didn't qualify as an import because I was I was British born. I had a British passport, oh. uh, and Graham Lowe, um, who I who was then the Wigan coach, I got over there, and I and when I was, I was saying before, I really found my, my skill set. What 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 I what the reason England was so good to me because it was not as defence orientated. It was a bit. Um, I just I kind of like let loose. What I remember that is like I I just. I chair. I, I I just backed my own ability a bit more. Like I, I wasn't worried about if it didn't come off, and I I kind of really found my feet. You know, like um, attack wise as well, not just in defence. Um, and I think that was probably um, uh, the biggest advantage for me. I I did really improve my, my offloading skills and that type of thing over there. Uh, and also, Lowy allowed me to do it too. Like he just just do whatever you're good at. Um, we we played the kangaroos. I had a like an absolute blinder against the kangaroos, like a, probably one of the best games of my life. Um, uh, but again, and that's only because it, it sounds hard. But when you find your confidence, and, and people playing sport would realise this, when you play with that self confidence, it's it's kind of magical. It's almost like um, a feeling of being totally unbeatable or a, a real level of complete confidence within your own ability um and i was kind of playing with that with that skill i only really found that i probably found that same sense of um confidence probably about half a dozen times in my career and every time i did i kind of really peaked at those times um yeah. but yeah that the, 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 the thing at wigan and, and that was really good for me personally i came back i had a like a super year in 1987 yeah. um uh in 88 I had a terrible year, lost my confidence again. 89, I had a really good year because I found my confidence again. Yeah. Kind of and weird. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the thing with, um, you know, a lot of kids coming through is that they got to find their confidence. <clears throat> it's backing you know? yourself. It's trusting yeah. yourself. It's like, and having not, not the bravery, but like sometimes, yeah, it, it kind of is brave just to, to back your own skill talent. You know what I mean? Like, just to really, like, yeah, it is. Sometimes you get so preoccupied, preoccupied with, with the game tactics and what the coach wants, you forget. Oh, you know, I can play football. I've got, you know, I do have something that no one else has. Yeah. Um, I was reading up, mate. You know, um, the year that you come come out as a gay man um, to the sports to the sports world, being that first person um, to come out in the rugby league um, history, I guess. How how did that sit? with the rest of your teammates and the rest of the media and like, how were you feeling when, when you did that? Um, such a long time ago, James. I was, I mean, um, it was always like the really, it was, <laughs> I'm kind of making light of it. I mean, I know, I know it, it, um, it, it is kind of difficult when you look back and think, oh, I suppose, you know, that was me, but it, so long ago, I kind of forget. <laughs> And I, I was always like the worst kept secret in rugby league. I was gay. Like I, even when I was at South, people knew I was. I, I used to go to Oxford Street and frequent bars, and um, uh, I mean, I never stuck in people's faces. But I do remember when I went left South in '89 to go to Manly. I had made in my mind up that I was going to come out publicly. My family knew. I'd spoke. I told my family in, in about '87, um, uh, and I was going to come out publicly but there was a guy and I, I do like to tell this every time I speak about my situation I, I, I mention the, the story I'm about to tell because I do believe uh, I, I kind of like to honour you know, the, 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 the shoulders of other people of the giants are, um, that I stood on there was a guy by the name of Justin Fashion in 1990 an English player, an English soccer player in, prim, in the Premier League and um and now, now I'm now going back to a time, mate, when we didn't have like mobile phones and that. So to follow the news, you had to either watch the TV, listen to the radio, or read newspapers, right? Yeah. Um, but Justin Fashion who was uh, uh, in the Premier League, um, and he came out as a gay man, and um, he was like crucified by the, the English League and um, the supporters of the game. Uh, he came out in 1990. He retired in '94, and he died of suicide in '98, right? So, but that, I mean, that's, that's a really sad story. I know, but that, that is, I'm, I'm now nearly 60. I'm 59 this year. That is such a familiar story for a gay, for a gay person to hear that, that, that process that is not unusual. I do remember, but in 1990, when I was going to Manly and I was going to come out, 
I just thought, oh, shit, I'm not ready for this. I'm just like, not that I'm not ready for this. Yeah. When you come out, it's not just about you. It's about those people around you as well. Like your family are going to have to like have to deal with it. And I, I, I did think, I just, I've actually felt for my family. I just, I don't think they're ready for this. Like, like, I, I mean, everyone knew I was going. I've never, honestly, James, I've ever, never had an issue with me being same sex attracted ever since I was a kid, ever. Um, but yeah, I just haven't. I mean, I've never had that internalized homophobia. Um, coaches have spoken to me about it and this, that, and I'm always like, oh, that's just who I am. Like, George Piggins once spoke to me about it. Um, just saying, you know, like, I, I, I probably shouldn't go up to Oxford Street and all that, you know, it doesn't look good. But he was saying it in, in a caring way. Like, he was doing it, he was a man of his time, you know what I mean? He thought he was doing the right thing, but I was just, it wasn't an issue to me. So then in 94, when I came out, mate, I was, um, I just didn't care anymore. I mean, I, I don't know how to put it. I'm making it sound really blase. I know it was, it was seen as quite a big thing, but for me, it, was, it just allowed me to breathe out. It was almost like I gave permission to everyone else to breathe out as well. It was almost like I had been the elephant in the room for such a long time. You know, it was like people didn't want to talk to me about it because people didn't want to make, they thought they were making me feel uncomfortable. Did that make sense? Yeah. Well, like yep. people, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, mate. It was, um, I'm, I'm making it sound, I, I sound like I'm brushing over. I don't mean it to sound so, um, uh, I mean, I know it was quite a big event, like publicly, um, yeah. but it's hard, hard when it's you. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I know I'm not going to say, mate, that, that all the players now took it well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that at all. I totally get it. Um, uh, there, there were some players that were very, were very uncomfortable, mate. Like, they were very awkward with it. Um, and, I, you know, my <laughs> the whole shower thing, like, it, it, there was a couple of times situations you know, players would, would seem to be uncomfortable and that sharing is like in the same room. And I'd be like, mate, trust me, you're safe. Like, don't, <laughs> you know, don't, don't flatter yourself. Don't flatter yourself. I'm not, you know, like uh, it's the stuff like that. When I used to make you like a joke about it, mate, you're like, yeah. that kind of made it easy for people. And I'm not going to say there wasn't those, those moments, you know, with supporters, with other players, that, that, that those people who, you know, just weren't comfortable with that, with that fact, yes, I mean, yes, that happened, and yes, it happened. Um, yeah, you know, when I say frequently, it wasn't, it wasn't unfamiliar, if that makes. I mean, like it just, um, but you know, like I, um, it's all good. Like it's, I kind of found as a gay man, I, um, I, I, I would say, and James, I'm just, I, I mean, I'll say this to him, to him like people ask me. I am so glad. I'm. I love being gay. I'm so glad I'm gay. Like I, I know it sounds weird. Like people, I just like to say that to people. Just like people, there's. I have no like. If, if ever people think there's any, I feel any sense of shame. No, it's just like being gay is me my superpower. I mean, and I mean that for rugby league as well. Like being gay has really helped my the, the way I the style of my game and who I am and and you know. And I say that um, with full full conviction, mate. I mean, I say it with full conviction. I, um, I, I feel so fortunate that I'm gay. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I it's hard, it's hard to explain, mate. I'm, I, like, I, yes, I've, I've got so many like little quirky stories I could tell you about players and coaches and stuff like that. Um, but I would say, like, overall, like, um, it's, it's been a positive effect for everyone, for most people that I've been at clubs with, because it's, um, I'm not saying it's, it's it's been a tool of education, but it's been good for people. Like, you know, like, you know, the whole in, in diversity inclusion stuff. I know that's very, that's you know, quite a hot topic and that at the moment, but back in the day, like, you know, it was, to have those types of conversation, I kind of allowed people to have those conversations, yeah. you know, like me, if, I don't know if that makes, I don't know how to explain it, but I was never, you know, and I, I really think curiosity and questions are a good thing. Like if someone has that in the room, like it's okay, if, and particularly in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a team sporting situation, it's good to be curious and to ask questions, um, you know, respectful stuff. You know, you, yeah. But 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 that's, that's bonding as well. You know, I get the I get what camaraderie is about caring for your mates and all that. It's like, yeah. you know, but I do believe curiosity is a really good thing for people. You know, you, know, sh you shouldn't be ashamed. You shouldn't be uncomfortable about being curious as long, and, and ask questions. I would I would always recommend that. Yeah, and it's so cool. Like you know, obviously you had those certain situations with certain players, but yeah. you know that that sort of era, um, you know, coming out as gay. 
that was a huge thing for people, and you know, it's still in that era where I guess people were still looking down on the on the gay community and all that sort of stuff. In, so, in, and, around Sydney, in and around Sydney, through the eighties and nineties, like you know, there was a whole load of murders in and around uh, the the, uh, the beaches here, with like, uh, gay men being thrown off cliffs. You know, there's only there's over seventy odd murders that have never been solved. It was all all around that time. Like I'm going to use the language that was used, mate. Poop to bashing was a real thing. You know, like it was in and around that time. That was all still happening. All yeah. that, like it was, you know, growing up, mate. I, um, um, you know, I didn't know what it was to be gay or homosexual, but I knew what a faggot and a poofta was. You know what I mean? Like it. That's because of the use of. The, I'm just being. I'm, I'm using the language, mate. So. I guess it's like, um, you know, all those derogatory terms and all that. People don't realise the weight and the severity and the damage that they can do. That's, that's yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I mean, I do stuff now for the NRL. I, I, I'm part of an educational course where we go around, speak to all the corporates and that, and, and all the players and that in and around this space and, and about the damage and the, you know, the potentially dangerous consequences that that, um, that off the cuff of remarks and, and, and that can make, um, how important it is for, for players to, you know, to to be truthful and bring their you know their, their full selves. Uh, uh, to when I say work, you know, and that's kind of is a working environment to work. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, and that that's so cool, man. That you're still doing stuff for the NRL for that so, um, for the the gay community, bring, uh, being able to give these young kids and um, people the opportunity to not feel yeah. like they're they're alone in the situation. I mean, I know there was a bit of a controversy, not last year, the year before, I think it was. Manly the, Jersey, uh, is that what you're going to say? Manly Jersey, yeah. yeah. Everyone says that, mate. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, um, and full credit to Manly, man, i got to say this, like most people don't know this, Manly were trying to do the right thing, what they thought was the right thing. They contacted me two months out from that that situation. And um, and I actually, I mean, I actually, I mean, I'm actually patron for an organisation called Pride in Sport, uh, Pride in Sport. Uh, they're, they're an NRL sponsor. They're one of their sponsors, and like believe it or not, part of their one of their programs is facilitating Pride Round. Right, so all those tools are there for clubs if they ever wanted to do it. Manly didn't even know about that. Like, they contacted me about two weeks out from that game. They said they said they wanted to do this Pride Round, and my my reaction, and I've said this before in public, my reaction, like I said, I'm nearly sixty as a gay man. My my initial reaction when some when when I'm asked that question, is have you had no pushback? And they were like, from who? I was like, well, from players, from sponsors, from supporters. I mean, my initial reaction is because there's always pushback on that. And I'm yeah. like, as, that. That's my reaction, only because I've had to deal with that in, in, in other aspects of my life, you know? Yeah. No, it's like, nah, no, nah, we've had, like, it's all been pretty good. The thing was, they hadn't asked enough people, really. Now, that, yeah. that, that's what it turned out to be. They didn't know about pride. They, they didn't know about pride in sport. They didn't know that it was a, a, actually an organisation that facilitate pride browns and let them know what's, what's, you know, what potentially what um, advantages and disadvantages and what they can expect. So it was kind of like, but they still went ahead with it, right? And I, I got to take my head off and my hat off to them because. Um, Yes, I had a conversation with Desi about two, and they lost every other. They lost every game from then on after that game, if you remember. Yeah. But like, I mean, I know there's six or seven players didn't play. Uh, and Desi, and, and like anyone who knows Desi, I, I played with Desi. I, Desi, um, Desi, straight up and down. He like he calls a spade a spade. He um, and he said to me a, a few weeks after after all the controversy and all that, and, and like it was kind of chaotic there for a while. And you know, the six players standing down. He, and like he and when he when he said this to me, I was you know, he kind of knocked me sideways. He said, "Mate, Robbo, I kind of realised I didn't realise how things how how difficult things had been uh, in and around that like in and around that space." He said, "Mate, but it, there are some things more important than two points." Now, now for Desi Hasler to say that to me, like it, he said, like it made me realise, mate, some you know, it made me realise some things are more important than two points. That's a big thing. That's a big statement coming from Desi. Everyone knows yeah. Desi. And he's right, but you know, like I, I do often feel like, um, in this space, like it, I, I don't even like using that term, but it's the only thing in and around this space is is, is the fancy is a fancy term. But I mean, I, I, I do sometimes feel like, um, uh, I feel like. I know, this sounds awful. I don't know. Like, not that I have to be the adult in the room, but I, I have to be very understanding of other, of other people's misunderstanding, yeah. and I have to be uh, like, like, we have to be able to 
communicate that and we have to be able to tolerate that and be accepting of that and, and be able to have a civil conversation around that all the time, which is like the only way to move forward is have a civil conversation. You have to be accepting of other people's misunderstandings and, well, not accepting, but understanding of it. And yeah. I, I do feel like that's where, you know, I come from most of the time. And I, and I think I've only been, been like that, mate, as I've gotten older, because, you know, like 30 years ago, I'd tell people, you know, yeah, you know, like I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. So I said before, yeah. Mum, I'm not proud of that, but that's kind of age worries us all, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it's so cool that you know you're still involved with that sort of stuff. Um, you know, yeah. and that these people like Desi, you know, are right behind it. Um, you know, and like like you said, hats off to the Manly Club for sticking with it. Yeah, yeah um, they went, they went ahead with it. Yeah, they went ahead with it. They could have pulled out at any moment, but they went ahead with it, mate. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um. After retirement, mate, you um you had a bit of a controversy with uh, getting uh, lawsuits filed against you from Gary Jack. Um, like I remember, I was watching, like I said, watching a few videos, researching up, and the incident they're talking about. I mean, how how did that all happen? No, that was that was a young young guy acting out, mate. Who had a chip. Like I said, I've said it a number of times, even if this interview I, I did have a chip on my shoulder mate I really regret that situation mate and Gary had every every right to um to to um uh you know it was a civil case um mate yeah I it was, it was, that's, that, that the whole thing is something I do regret mate I, I wish it hadn't happened it was kind of difficult mate having to have his sons you know in court and that and and having photos of his dad like yeah it's mm-hmm. There's nothing to be proud of, mate, and it's nothing I've, I've ever been. Yeah, I, I don't regret, and, and I don't begrudge um, Gary and, and his family taking that action, mate. They had every right to. Yeah, no, that's fair enough, mate. And you know, you can hear, I oh, just, just then, you know, you can hear the remorse in your voice about it. Yeah, it's, um, it's, you know. it was just really ugly, mate, and it was just, yeah, like I do really regret it, mate. And like I, yeah. um, it was like I said, I had a chip on my shoulder. It was just, it was a spark, like it, yeah. It was, just, yeah. it was like the spark to the fly, you know. Like it was just, it was just a bad. It just got me on a bad day. Yeah. yeah. Um, a year after that, though, you you win in two thousand. You win the um, Australian Sports Medal. For your contributions to the rugby league and and community, mate. How 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 special did that make you feel? Um. My, the, the, um, acknowledgement is is always flattering, mate. Like you know, it's um, yeah, it, 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 it's um, yeah, it's always flattering, mate. Like, it, you know, everyone has an ego. It's nice to be recognised, but uh, you know, I, I would I would also say, I mean, um, it's nice to be recognised, but I I don't think many people do it to be recognised. You know what I mean? It's almost like it's um. Yeah, if it feels like the right thing, it normally is, you know. And if you're doing the right, if you feel good about stuff, uh, you know, it, it it is normally good stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's um, um, yeah. I, it was, I think it was just after. Uh, I think I got that just after. I think it was after the uh, New Guinea tour because I I did a, um because I I've been doing a whole load of stuff. I was we uh, we were on tour for the when well, I was playing for Australia. We played. I think two tests over New Guinea, but we had like a three or four week tour up there. It was great. Like I was spending a lot of time in all the tri- like in, in the villages and tribes and yeah, uh, cool. like rugby league, the, the rugby league players are like got like you've never seen anything like it. Like I thought people were fanatical here. My like, God, like in New Guinea, next level, like total. The, the, we uh, we met I met that many like um Mao Meningas. There's so many people like that, that, so many so many people have named their kids Mao Meninga and, and Martin Belly, Martin Martin Belly. Ma, 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 oh my God. Um there was oh my God. Uh yeah, like it was it's phenomenal how I think it's a national sport as well. Like and, and we, yeah. we were playing up in the mountains and, and like in all these really remote places, but like everyone knew like every 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 village up knew every individual. Like it, yeah. it was um, and I was spending quite a bit of time in in, in some of the, uh, the training schools. I was spending a lot of time in the training schools out there. That's uh, it was great, man. It was like wonderful. Yeah, yeah that would have been so cool. Uh, it was. Um, it is one of those fond memories. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, you also get into acting, mate. You went to the, uh, acting school um, to get into acting. Um, you know, you make a few appearances and stuff like that. 
Um, I, um, I was always part. Like, growing up, I was more. Part, I was always part of the ensemble at school. Um, yeah. It's always like I was always like a little show off. So, so I used to like to act. Um, and I kind of, I mean, I, that was kind of always, I always loved acting. I mean, I used to play footy because everyone played footy, you know, like yeah. that's, that's just what everyone did. Um, and then when I I finished school, I became an electrician, but like rugby league kind of took off of me, but I was still doing community stuff, acting and that. And then um, uh, when I retired, I just quite literally, uh, my car broke down just up the road from NIDA, the National Institute of Dramatic Arts, which is what this school you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and as I was walking by the school, I was walking up to the service station to get my, you know, find someone to fix my car. I just thought I'd wander in there and see if there's someone there could help me. Uh, do some like some one on one act like uh, coaching and that. Just to, I, I was thinking about getting back into uh, uh, community um, theatre. Yeah. Um, and I met a guy by the name of Kevin Jackson. Changed my life. Kevin took me under his wing a bit. And then I, and like he, um, uh, I, I like yeah, he uh, really helped me. And then a year later, I, I did the uh, the auditions to do the uh, to do the three year degree in acting. I was lucky enough to get in, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I went and, sp and I've been kind of acting off and on ever since. But I will say this, mate. I mean, I wish I, I, I wish I could say that you know, like um, I'd had not more success, but if I had to survive on my acting checks uh, to eat, I'd, I'd go pretty hungry. You know what I mean? Um, so, but I, 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 do, I do love whenever I get the work. I do love it. I mean, that, that is, if you want to talk about passion and that type of thing, that's. Yeah, I do like uh, that, that. I would say that's where my passion is. If, yeah, 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 yeah. And you've had some pretty, um, been in some pretty decent shows and movies as well. And like, I was reading up that you were, um, uh, in the Star Wars, the second oh, one, that, Attack yeah, of the yeah, Clones. That's a lot, yeah, that, that was that, those things. That, yeah, that was more fun than anything, mate. I, I yeah. mean, I spent, I spent like, um, I spent nearly six years in LA. I was working most of the time in LA. That was great. I was, uh, I've been back here for about eight years. That was, that's phenomenal working over there. A lot of a lot of B grade stuff, but a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I've, 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 like I've, I've kind of reg, I've been regularly working more often on, but like for about the last five or six years since being back. I think um, the next thing that uh, that I mean it's, that that will have a profile is uh, the, uh, uh, Furiosa, the next Mad Max film. Uh, okay, we're, yeah. we're in. Um, we were in Broken Hill a couple of years ago. Uh, that was shot, yes, two years ago we shot that. Wow. Um, it was in Broken Hill for like about, nearly about four months filming yep. that. Um, did a whole lot of filming in Sydney as well. Um, done other stuff here, like um, a lot of bits and pieces of, of theatre, community theatre and that. Um, yeah. It was, oh, Mr. In Between was a really good show to be a part of. Yeah, as well. Yeah. That was an Australian production. Yeah. It was great. But, but I mean, yeah, like, I, I, like I said, mate, uh, I'd love to act more. So if there's any producers out there, any directors, <laughs> but hello. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Well, mate, hopefully we can get you on the ad to be the uh, the voice for the um, first team, mate. That'd be Absolutely. cool. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, speaking of the first team, mate, um, you would have probably seen in the news, you know, PNG's um, pretty much in prime seat to get the, the next mm. um, team, Lex license. Um, a lot of people, uh, I know there was a poll that went out to 30 of the NRL coaches and 51 or 50% of them voted for Perth to be next instead of PNG. Um, and then obviously the North Sydney Bears are one of these teams that everyone wants to get back in, but it's not going to happen in in the Sydney, saturated Sydney competition at the moment. Where, where's where's your thoughts lie on where where the NRL should go? Uh, mate, I like it. You know, every, I suppose everyone's got an opinion. I, I, I don't, I don't know enough of the research that's gone into that, mate. I, I do know that. Um, I mean, ha having played in New, in New Guinea a number of times, um, a bit up there, four times at various times. I do know it's incredibly fanatical. I mean, I don't know, um, uh, stadium wise, and what you know, like what sort of facilities like professional teams would be expecting to go there to find uh, yeah. you know like a, you know but but I also don't know what the franchise looks like I don't you know where the money comes from I do know it's an like it, it is rugby league craziness in, in, in Z. um 
the Western Australia. Um, I don't know. Like I said, mate, I don't know enough about. Uh, I don't know about uh, enough of the behind the scenes stuff to to to, to, to yeah. give you a uh, a more confident choice. Well, where where would you prefer a team to be based? Like, just your personal opinion on um, like for me myself. Like, I'm a Broncos man, um, and I have been since I was a little kid, and I will be till the day I die. But for me, I I want a Perth team. You know, I live here. I want to be able to take my kids to the games, all that sort of stuff. I want a, a pathway for my kids because I've yeah. got a few of them that play. So I want them to be able to have that option, um, especially in a country or, you know, a state like this where AFL dominant, we've got rugby yeah. union, um, you know, soccer and cricket are, are pretty big as well. Rugby league is... Because we've got a lot of expats from New South Wales, Queensland, you know, all these people that come yeah. over, New Zealanders, um, Islanders, and even the English that come over here. So there is a lot of support here for it. Um, yeah, and that's why I, I want a Perth team is, you know, it's for the future of my kids and my kids' generation, their friends, um, you know, to have that opportunity to, to get there. Mate, I'm sure all that. I mean, I absolutely believe all those reasons you just said then are valid. But again, mate, I, I mean, I, I don't know what the uh, what the league would be looking for. In a, I mean, I you know, you're out, I'm out of my depth there, mate. I yeah, um, yeah out of my depth there, mate. I, I I think um, I mean, I played in Western Australia a number of times too. I mean, I um, uh, with the whole Super League thing, but even even prior to that, we I remember playing over there for Manly a, a number of times as well. Um, but yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely take on board all that you said, mate. You know, they, 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 those are absolutely valid reasons why a franchise, you know, uh, would possibly could yeah could possibly work there. Yeah, no, that's fair enough, mate. Um, you know, there's lots of things that you've done in your career that you've gone through in your career, mate. Um, is there one thing that, or a couple of things that someone has said to you? Um, that has stuck with you and that you've used um, through your rugby league career, through your acting career, that's made you into a better person um, or partner that you are today? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, you know, like I, I think I said before, um, I was talking about when I went to Wigan, I kind of realised my value, like my, uh, my uh, what made me Good player is very. It's a very individual thing. It's like acting. I mean, it's I've, I, when I said about reaching those peaks uh, when I had confidence and I was playing really well. There, there were different times in, uh, in my career. Um, you know, I've, I've had those moments acting as well, where just being on stage or whatever, you kind of realize like there's so much more. Like, it's like sport. There's so much more going on than it looks like it's going on, right? Yeah. Uh, just those moments of, of, of pure confidence and just like just sometimes trust you know just I know it sounds weird but trust trusting yourself like as an actor make trusting in your choices you make that you make the personal choices you make for the role and stuff like but just try absolutely trusting in them and backing them with confidence it's not like it's yeah I mean everyone's an individual and you're an individual like and we, we all we, we can all shine as an individual there's nothing wrong with who you are it's just like I mean, I present myself different to everyone else you, you, you've spoken to. I mean, as and as they do as well. But, you, you know, you said something nice before when you said I, I sounded sincere in what I was saying. Like, I would like to think that, that you know, that's what I mean about just trusting yourself. You are good enough. You, you are always good enough. Like, trust in that. But it does take, sometimes takes, you know, it took me a long time to understand that as well. Like, it took me, yeah. I mean, I don't think I ever, um, I think, you know, it's only been the last five years of acting that, that, that that's dropped in for me as well as as it did when I was playing rugby league but you gotta but you gotta keep rehearsing like you gotta you gotta keep like you know like um nothing comes easy you gotta keep you know, you, you, you know we when I do public speaking and that you kind of find out what works for you and what doesn't you had your own little bag of tricks almost and it's almost like um and it works for you it's just like but trusting in that yeah just trust yourself yeah I don't know if that's any advice but no, that's 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 really good good advice, and I think you know the young kids of today. Um, you are good enough. I always think, mate. You are all, you're good enough. Like yeah. as you are now, you're always good enough. And like it's, yeah, I, um, th yeah, that's what I always try. Like I, 
Yeah, and it, but, it's, but actually believing in that, like finding that space where you can believe in that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, mate. Yeah, no, no, that's all right, mate. That's, and that's absolutely right, mate. You're absolutely 100% correct with it. You know, these kids need to believe in, in themselves. I think yeah. it does come a point where it, it uh, goes over the border to, to cockiness and arrogance. And yeah, I we think... all need, but and that's the other thing, mate. We all need help, you know. It's okay to, yeah. it's, it's okay to accept help. Help with all that. Like it's okay to to listen to people and and to be educated and, and take that on. It's like you know, we all need help with things. Well, you know, no, yeah. no, you know, like when I say we're, you know we're all good enough. It's, yeah, yes, we are. But you know, we no, we can always be better. We can always be better yeah. ourselves. You know what I mean? It's not like it's okay to it's okay to accept help. Like it's okay yeah. to you know I haven't got I haven't got a handle on this or you know like a oh, like can I get a, can I get a, like I'm going to need some yeah. assistance here or can someone just explain this to me? I mean, the other thing is, man. I, I mean, there's probably a good example I can tell you. I couldn't read and write, mate. When I, I mean, I only learned to read and write in my late thirties. I was, I was, I was. When I was a kid, dyslexia wasn't a thing, right? Like when, when I was a kid, you're just dumb, and I was always really ashamed of that. Like it, I couldn't read and write. I repeated first class uh, when I was like six years old, so I was always a year older than my year going through school, and I was yeah. always incredibly embarrassed and shameful. Like I said, you, know, I wasn't ever ashamed of being same sex attracted. My, the thing yeah. for me was I was always incredibly ashamed of not being able to read and write. I was that kid in class when the teacher said, oh, Ian, can you get up and read, you know, you're reading books, whatever, re read from page 34 onwards. I'd, I'd throw the book around, I'll kick the table over, make it about something else and get sent home. I got suspended so many times. But yeah. only because I was so ashamed of not, like I'd make it about something else. I was always really fearful um, of being asked to read for stuff. Like, like right through my right through my 20s and like my early 30s i mean when i first went to nida when i said to you kevin jackson that teacher i met changed my life the reason he changed my life is when i first met him that 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 very first day he gave me he, he asked me to do a cold read for him and that's just when they give you a book a scene in the book and you got to read it right yeah and i was like, I was like just and he could sense something that was wrong he says are you okay and i just it was one of those moments i just went oh man I can't, i'm so embarrassed i'm like i feel so awkward telling you i can't read and he was like, he was the first, his reaction was like, you know, they say there's one teacher in your life who changes your life, will change your life. He was this guy, yeah. he was that teacher for me. He was, it was the first time someone said, oh, that's okay. He sounds like you're dyslexic. He said, what we'll do is, it was so not a problem, right? He said, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll take the scene, go home, learn it, listen to it. Come but just listen to it as much as you can, learn as much as you can by listening to it, come back and we'll do it then. And that's kind of like, that kind of changed my life. It was almost like the first time. So I mean, this year, so I'm now a, about 35, okay? It was, all, it was like this thing of just like, for the first time, I didn't get low. My head didn't get hot. I didn't get all embarrassed and shameful. It's almost like, oh, I don't feel bad. And like, I learned to I learned to read and write. I mean, I'm not, like I said, mate, I'm no, I'm no Shakespeare. I can read and write, basically, right? But yeah. I, I learned to read and write because of phonetics. And that's what I learned at, at NIDA. At, 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 but it, like, it's one of those things. It's like, we can always be more, we can always do better. Like, it's okay to accept help. Changed my yeah. life. Mate. That's why, what I do now, and I don't know if I mentioned to you, I'm mixed up. Most of the oxygen in my life is taken up with an organisation called Qtopia. We're opening a, a, a pride museum here in Sydney. We actually opened this Friday. I've been working on that for four years, and I'm all the way education, like education, education, education. We have, yeah. we, you know, we've been working with the... Um, with the state education department uh, having syllabus and curriculum written for uh, in and around the LGBTIQA plus. See how quick I said that? Um, LGBTIQA plus um, community. Um, uh, but it's about education, right? Like, I'm really about education now, mate. I'm so, such a big champion for education. So that's what I tell the people. You know, it's, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask for help. Yeah. That was quite that's the answer, so cool, wasn't mate. it? You didn't expect that. I, I, <laughs> no, I didn't, but that's that's awesome, mate. And like honestly, um, like my partner's got dyslexia. Um, you know, yeah, her one her one comes to with numbers, and so does oh. um her daughter. Her daughter, like, and I'm I'm really good with numbers, so I'm able to help them. And, and numbers you know, save me too. It's, it's one of those. It's funny to hear you say that numbers. Yeah. I was always good at maths at school. I thought that numbers. I wasn't always okay with numbers, letters, but yeah. I mean, I. Just I don't know whatever it is. I just don't make sense. The alphabet doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah, and that's I think it's one of those things. You know, again, um, same with um, yourself coming out. As, as the generations got older and society has changed, it's become more acceptable to yeah have dyslexia or 
you know, all these other other things that are, are in part of life. That education, that's, more that's, that's, exactly, that's the yeah. power of education. That's the power of education. It's just like, you know, it's, it's okay to learn. Like, you know, we that's how we learn. That's how we that's how we grow. That's how. Oh, well, anyway. I, sorry, but I feel like I'm carrying on yeah. now. So. No, no, but, and, but this is the thing. I love the passion that you're you're describing all this stuff with me. It's it's so cool to see. Um, you know, I've had people come on here that haven't had the exact passion they're, they're sort of happy to help me out um but you know the passion that you're showing is awesome man i really appreciate it and i'm sure the fans that watch this um will, will appreciate the passion that you, you still got for life and for education and and everything that you do mate so um you know don't lose that passion mate whatever happens don't lose, don't lose that passion kind of you say Joe. that's kind of you say thank you no that's cool um one thing before we um, we finish the recording, mate, is um, you mentioned um, the work that you're doing with that. Uh, Utopia. Uh, yeah, Utopia. How, how do people get involved with that? Like, how, what, is there a website or anything that yeah, they get involved um, with? QtopiaSydney.com.au. There's, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff. You know, for us to succeed, uh, we've had incredible support from all levels of government, from um, council through the uh, state, through the feds. Um, incredible support um, with there's a couple of philanthropists as well. Um, we're looking to raise money, but there's a, there's volunteering and stuff that you know we, we won't succeed unless the community. And when I say the community, I mean the greater community. This isn't yeah. this, this, this isn't a queer. I, I use queer as an umbrella term. Okay, I don't really like that term, but I'm using it yeah. as a LGBTIQA plus instead of saying that all the time. It, it's like. Uh, as a quit, you know, we only succeed. The museum only succeeds if the wider community get get behind us and like and realize the value of, you know, it telling it, it'll be telling stories, you know, like colonization, pre-colonization, illegality, the legality, the seventy eighties, how Mardi Gras started, the whole AIDS epidemic, um, uh, all the deaths in there's a, we we have multiple stories to tell, mate. Yeah, yeah, multiple yeah. stories. That's so cool. Um, well, yeah, yeah so hopefully. www.qtopiasydney.com.au. Uh, just there's a website. Check it out. Yeah, beautiful. I'll um I'll put that up on the on the socials and um you know people right. can check it out as well, mate. Um, is there anything else that you're doing these days besides for that, mate? God, isn't that enough? Um, <laughs> uh, mate, I feel like I feel like I'm I'm like um, juggling a thousand balls and. <laughs> That's probably not a bad, a good choice for a, <laughs> for a gay man. I feel like I'm juggling chainsaws is a better description. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's no. I mean, I've, I've got a lot going on. You could say, yeah. But I'm very yeah. fortunate too. I'm, I'm like, I'm not saying that in, in a bad sense. Yeah, yeah. It's all yeah. good. No, that's cool, mate. Um, mate, that's that's all I got for you. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up the recording. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Ian Roberts, thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with, James? I'm a phone call away, mate. No, I really appreciate it, mate. Um, Ian Roberts, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. I really appreciate you giving me your time. My pleasure, mate. You take care, James. You too, mate. Bye.